Hi, and welcome to Homo Ludens, the channel on history and board games. Today, I'm really happy to have a discussion with Sheria Ayuandini, whose game Cartini is on Kickstarter right now. This game was one of the projects that came out of the Zenobia Awards. And if you're interested in those, we made a couple of videos on them. I will add some links in the description. Thanks, uh, Sheria, for taking the time. How are you doing today? Doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Fred. I'm quite excited about our conversation. Yeah, but it's really a pleasure to, to, to have you on. As I was saying to you before we started recording, uh, I was wondering if you could start by maybe introducing yourself. Uh, who is Sheria outside of the Cartini project? What are you doing uh, outside of designing games? Yes. So I'm Sheria, and um, I was born an Indonesian, but right now I'm a Dutch citizen who's living in Singapore, basically. Um, and outside of designing game, uh, well, a little bit of my background, uh, I have um, a dual PhD in medical anthropology and political sociology. And throughout the most part of my career, I always have one foot on the academia and one foot in a more what I call a uh, practical uh, world, I suppose. Um, and what I do is that most of the times I am doing uh, research and monitoring and evaluation. And I work a lot with uh, national governments, with international organizations, so including aid agencies such as Australian aid um, and bilateral agencies as well, or international agencies such as different UN offices, like UNDP, UNICEF, the World Bank. And what I do is that I consulted uh, these organizations and national governments about uh, different uh, social issues. So, for example, um, I would consult them about uh, citizenship rights or um, civil services or um, social assistance and um, everything that is uh, often related to public health. And I do that usually first from by um, doing kind of like some sort of research or data collection or doing monitoring and evaluation, which will then inform their policy making um, or program planning to hopefully address those issues in a much more kind of like um, adequate and contextual um, appropriate way. Uh, so that's what I do. And like I mentioned before, I, uh, I grew up in Indonesia and then I moved to and my um, graduate study first started in the United, the United States. So I was in Missouri for a while. And then um, the second part of my graduate study, which is when I was attaining my um, sociology um, degree, I moved to the Netherlands. I lived in Amsterdam for about eight years before I moved here to Singapore, which was just the end of last year. Yeah, so that's me outside of board gaming. Okay, a lot of traveling, mm -hmm. but it's it's interesting, uh, and it, all of this sounds really uh, pretty distant from actually uh, the, um, the, mm. the gaming hobby as uh, as yeah. a, like as a, as a whole. Were you a gamer before uh, starting this project of designing Cartini, or what was your relationship with gaming? I've always been a gamer. I always felt like anthropology is my training, but I was uh, as a ga I'm a gamer by birth, basically. So um, I started playing games since very, very young. And I always credit my parents for that. So I play games any, in any form that you can think of, starting from, you know, kind of like backyard games that uh, children would play and then also including console games. Um, my father introduced uh, us, me and my sisters, there are three of us, we're all uh, girls. Uh, we played games since we were very, very young uh, with the type of PC at that time that was just, you know, a very basic ones. I remember playing, oh, I don't even remember what the name of it, you know, like the, the kind of games that, that you need to bounce balls onto like a moving bricks, something very simple like that. We played that since we were very young. And then uh, my parents also introduced us to board gaming. Um, so it's always been part of my life all the time. But because I grew up in Indonesia, board gaming is not something that is very easy to acquire in Indonesia. So um, any chance I got I will always look for a board game. Um, I used to live in a small town in Indonesia, so that's even make it harder to find any board games, even mainstream ones. So whenever I go to a bigger city like Jakarta, for example, the capital, I will always find time to go to a place where I think there will be a board game that I can buy. And I don't care what kind of board game that is. I'll just, you know, I'll just buy it because I always wanted to just increase my board game collections. 
and board game has always board game and gaming has always been kind of like um, I feel like my all of my important life events revolve around board game and gaming, including um, how I met my husband at the moment. That's also surrounding gaming. So I feel like it's it's almost like um, I always joke that it's all, it almost felt like very religious to me, my relationship to gaming, because like whenever I think about important uh, moments in my life, there's some sort of a game element to it. So yeah, so I've, I've never really... The game has always been a significant part of, of my life. I remember my my husband at, at that time, my boyfriend asked, like, if um, there are important things in your life, what 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 is the kind of like, what makes you happy? And I always answer that there are three foundations of my happiness, which is uh, color, stories, and games. So as long as I have these three things in my life at any point, I'm golden, basically. So yeah, so games, they're, yeah, they're very, very, very important uh, for me. But that's yeah, that's really interesting. I like this idea of uh, color story and games. We'll probably come back to it when we talk about uh, your game. Did you did you see early on the potential of board games to portray history? Were there games that inspired you in that direction, or is that something that came a bit later when you started working on Zenobia? It's a both ways because I am familiar with some games that might have some. Um, kind of like inspiration from history or just kind of like a, a cultural context uh, or geographical context that would either inform the gameplay or just as a setup of the board game. I think um, one of the games that everyone would probably be aware of, you know, things like uh, Carcassonne or Catan, which back then when I started playing it is still called Settlers of Catan, is obviously something that has some element of history of it or some kind of like inspiration of history of it. So I've never really divorced games or board games from historical context. So I always know that that's part of kind of like board game DNA. But in terms of playing games that are just very much entrenched in history or is almost quote unquote a replication of history it's not necessarily what I tend to play because um, my own preference in terms of board gaming I do like playing euro games more uh, so even like the very driest euro games I'm actually quite happy playing them even though I agree that themes really help when it comes to making people feel a little bit more that they can enjoy the board games more. I, I, I understand it, under, you know, always feel like it's part of uh, board gaming, uh, historical is uh, historical information, basically, in historical context. But it's not necessarily always the kind of games that I play. And maybe before we start talking specifically about Cartini, I was thinking, could you maybe give us a bit of a broader review of the historical context that you picked for for that game and what you're trying to represent just for, for our listeners to understand what the game is about? Yes, of course. So Cartini is set in the late 1800 and early 1900 Indonesia. So this is still the time of Dutch colonialism in Indonesia, but particularly this is the time where there began a realization that the women of Indonesia needs to start having the same position with the counterparts, right, with the men of Indonesia. So that's the time when there's a realization that there needs to be an education for women and women taking parts in society. So Kartini is uh, one of the um, heroes, what we call in Indonesia at that time, that really introduced this idea. And she is considered to be um, the the mother of education in Indonesia, specifically for women, but education in general. Because at that time, when she was really, really young, she was younger than 25 because she actually passed away when she was 25 years old. Uh, She started to establish schools for girls and for women. And that's how the idea of educating women proliferated all across Indonesia. And then after her passing, um, the years afterwards, when we start to have a women movement and women's organizations, they're all using Kartini idea as the foundations of their movement, basically. Um, yeah, so what I want to highlight is just the, the Kartini, Kartini is definitely kind of like the, the figure uh, for that movement, but the entire idea that I want to represent in the board game itself is the idea of when how you when you educate women, you kind of lift the entire society as a whole. And is Kartini still, is, does she still a popular figure today in Indonesia? Or like yes, very very, yeah. So. yeah, so she is, um, so we have um, several figures in the past that we consider to be a national hero. So there's even an entire law to 
to put a label on someone to be considered a hero. So it's something that is quite uh, quite important in Indonesia. And Kartini is one of our most celebrated heroes. So she even have uh, she even has her own uh, day in Indonesia. So every 21st of April, that's the Kartini day. And every 21st of April, the young children, usually when they're in kindergarten, they would dress up and they would dress up as what they aspire to be in the future, you know? So if they want to be a doctor, they want to be a firefighter, they want to be a soldier, whatever it is that they want to be, they would dress up as that character. Sometimes they also dress up as, you know, like cartoon characters and everything like that. But it became a celebration of aspirations and the potentials of young Indonesian to be to be someone in the future. Going back to the game now and, and tying back this historical context to the game itself, I was wondering what compelled you to make a game specifically about uh, about this? What were you trying to achieve? And because making a game is a massive effort, so... <laughs> why, to, why, why to focus on this specifically? What was the motivation for you behind it? So the Zenobia Award is definitely the main motivation behind it because I felt like um, it's the right time for that award to be introduced. Prior to that, we I think as, as a community, we've been talking about surfacing more of games of diverse uh, background, diverse themes, um, especially those who might say something about decolonialization, right? Because there's a lot of games um, in our modern board gaming right now that might replicate a little bit of um, the mechanism of colonialism, so to say, uh, you know, conquering a place and then pillaging or taking resources from that place to then use it to conquer other places, for example, and, and, and other elements of mechanism that um, maybe a little bit reminiscent of colonialism. So I think there has been some calls in terms of how do we how do we diversify? How do we bring about the other side of the story? How do we bring into our hobbies other themes um, and maybe also showcasing other brains behind uh, board gamings or board game designs? When I came across the Nobi Awards, that's what I what I see it as, and um, I've been I've been really passionate about the issue in the past, and I felt like I would like to give a go to be kind of like part of the solution, so to say, if we, we call it a solution, to just figure out what I can do, even though a tiny bit. Uh, so I decided to uh, join the competition. Um, and at that time, when I was thinking, I, I really want to say something or want to make a game that is informed by uh, Indonesia's history. And Kartini's story just was the very first thing that came to mind, because I feel like the mechanism of the game is very much just following the story in a sense, kind of um, this entire idea of building schools for girls and then what they can do after they graduate and how what they've done after graduation really helped the liberation of Indonesia overall. So I almost felt like the game kind of wrote itself. Uh, so it was, it was, it was, it was my very first design and I felt like it might be, so complicated if not for the fact that I feel like the story is already there and all I need to do is just to translate that in the form of a board game. And that's really interesting because at, at the beginning of our discussion you talked about the fact that one of the first games that you play were Catan and I think that Catan is a really good example of, of that of um, of sh showing colonialism in a very uh, like light way, you know, in the, you know, yeah. which is, bit, uh, <laughs> it is, yes, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, and, and, and actually, I was wondering so, uh, a couple of months ago, we had a panel about exactly about this about playing colonialism, mm -hmm. and we had Marie Flanagan, the author of, of this book, uh, Playing Oppression. And I was wondering if you, if you, if you read this one or, or if you, if, if you haven't uh, read it yet, I haven't it's, it sounds like something that I would really enjoy. I think so too, and that's why I'm I'm talking about it because if you if you haven't read it, I would really recommend having a read. It, it talks about Catan, but it also talks about representation of colonialism in in most board games mm. and and how it's actually yeah. tied to uh, uh to the history of depiction of colonialism in in cultural production in in the Western world and and how it's a like a, a bit of a consequence of that and and how to look critically at it. So so I think it's uh it's really interesting. But then I, I want to ask you your opinion on this book. I would wait for you to read it. <laughs> Sure. Uh, yeah, sure, uh, sure, for sure. But but that's uh, that's really great. I had a question uh, regarding maybe also the audience that you were hoping to reach with with this game, because I was thinking about Zenobia Award. It was a very uh, 
I would say, North America centric, even if there were people from all around the world that joined most of the mentors there were uh, from the industry that is uh, in North America, most of them and everything. And I, I feel like most of the publishers that are picking up those games are either European or North American. And I was yeah. wondering, are you hoping that the game would be distributed in uh, Indonesia or at least Southeast Asia? Uh, what are your expectations ar around that, around who's going to play the game? Yeah, so um, this was actually one of the things that I kind of like struggle with at the beginning. And I had a lot of conversations about this with Zenobia people and also with my fellow Zenobia finalists um, at the end, was that I find it really interesting that you, I, you're absolutely right, right? Like with the context of Zenobia, then it is probably the main audience or the people who would play the game first and foremost are those who are in North America and in Europe. And to me, that's actually the reason why I do want to make the game. Because my concern when I started designing the game was that there is a trap of people thinking that when you design, quote unquote, a niche game, because of the theme of the games, right? Like it's not something that you've maybe uh, came across before. It's not something that is too familiar and it is about a specific group of people in a specific place. Then people would think like, oh, it's not really for me, right? Because you can't really relate to that. It, you know, it's not a context that you're familiar with. So I was worried that my game would be seen as an Indonesian game made by an Indonesian woman for Indonesian people. And the reason why I was a little bit worried about that was because I actually know quite a number of publishers of board games uh, in Indonesia, and they've come to, you know, convention like Essen, like uh, Essen Spiel. And whenever they're in Essen Spiel, that it's... It, it's a struggle to kind of um, attract people to their games because obviously their games are also showcasing a lot of different elements of Indonesian culture, right? So, so people tend not to be too interested because they're like, oh, we don't know anything about Indonesia. This is very specific, you know, uh, not sure whether it's something that we could enjoy. There's, there's, there's almost that kind of, um, kind of like, sen like a sentiment towards it. Um, so, I was worried about that a little bit, but at the same time, um, also the reason why I am thinking Zenobia is the right avenue for this, uh, because I could have gone with an Indonesian publisher, that's possible, but at the same time, that means I'm not reaching the audience that I want to reach, which is not just Indonesian people, because I believe that you can always play games from different cultural contexts. And when you do, it might actually be something that you enjoy. And by the end of the day, you know, you might learn something and might actually enrich your entire world, so to say. So because my aim is to introduce the context of Indonesia and to enrich kind of like our modern board gaming uh, pool in terms of themes and um, topics and everything like that. And that's why Zenobia is the actual, what I feel like is, is the right place to go rather than thinking like, oh, I should go with an Indonesian publisher and so on and so forth. And it's, it's really interesting. And actually, it makes me want to ask a question that I actually had planned for later in the interview, but I want to ask it now because I think it, it makes sense around the transition from the moment when you're making the game within the Zenobia context to the moment where it's published. Because I felt like, uh, so I was a jury in the Zenobia um, Awards. So I was spending some time with uh, some of the contestants, talking to them, talking about their games, reviewing them. And... It was really inspiring because it was a very open and free environment. In, in like all of the ideas could come through, uh, the designers could explore things and see how they wanted to approach game design overall. So it was a very um, free and open context. But the thing that I was a bit concerned by at the time, and of course I didn't mention it because that was not the time for it. But the, 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 now is probably the time to ask the question: Is what yeah. happens when you transition from Zenobia to the publishing process? Were you worried that? In that process, something might be lost about your game. The fact that you have maybe to tone down some of your crazy decisions to make it fit within the context of a publisher that is making a commercial product. Um, mm -hmm. So was that a concern that you had? And how did it go for you, for specifically Cartini? Uh, what kind of trade-off did you have to do? And, 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 and was it a hard process to go through? Yeah, that's, it's, that's definitely a specific um, concern of mine and something that I always you know, had at the back of my mind because... My concern at that time when I do want a game to be published, 
But I also know that sometimes games might be published and then rethemed, right? Because the entire idea is that, oh, we got the basic mechanism of the game and then maybe we can retheme it into something else with a theme that, you know, maybe a lot more people feel more comfortable about it. Uh, but at that time, I'm I was absolutely sure and still sure right now, you know, that I don't want that the theme to be changed, but not just the theme. Many other decisions in the game, I don't want it to be changed because even... Kartini, when you act, when you play it, that a lot of the mechanism of the game is very much informed by the historical context. It's very much informed by the stories. Uh, for example, we have hero cards in um, in the games, and the abilities of each of the heroes are very much informed of their story. You know what they were, what they did in 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 the time of the struggle against colonialism. Uh, that's just one example. So there are many other decisions, such as um, naming of the plays or um, the, the islands, for example, um, putting diversity as an important element of it. A lot of these is because there's, there's a specific story that I want to put forward and I want to celebrate through the board game. So those are the things that are very, very important to me that it, it won't change. So I felt that I was very lucky that I um, met with Iron Game Design that really understand the, the importance of all of these things. And they are very willing to preserve uh, my original vision for the game, and especially you know, these, these historical elements of it. So during the development of the games, if there is anything that I don't feel comfortable with because I feel like it's straying away from what the game uh, is meant to say, then they would pull back, you know, they would return back, they would, they would they would do a U-turn and then they'd be like, okay, we'll, let's, let's preserve that part of the game. And that's also including decision-making such as what kind of illustrations do we want to put in the game? I consulted a lot about the different elements, even things like the attire of the women being portrayed in the game. Are the women uh, came across the way that they might came across in um, their historical photos, for example, you know, stuff like that. The game is very steep in history, I would say. Um, it's not an exact replica of uh, the historical, uh, the, 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 the time uh, in, in history. It's not like it's exactly like this happens and then this happens and this happens. Of course, I also take some creative license in terms of making it more coherent as a board game. But there's a lot of elements in the game that is very much in form of how it was back then. And I'm very happy that, you know, Iron Game Design is very open to um, all of my inputs and, 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 staying true to, to my vision for the game. So, yeah, so, so thankfully, um, it, it has been quite a smooth ride. And, and, and that's what I was thinking, because when I was looking at the projects, I was really thinking it really depends which publisher is going to pick them up. And in a way, I think being picked up by Ion, and I'm, I'm not being paid by Ion. No publisher is giving me money. So, <laughs> yes. And, 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 and yes. I, I might have some criticisms about Ion Games, but overall what I like about sure. their approach to, to board game design, especially when it yeah. tackles history, is first they give a lot of power to their designer for um, building the, the, the vision that they have about their game, which is always something that is uh, definitely interesting. But they're really also yeah. very interested in the history and they are really like thinking about how does is the history portrayed within their game. So I think this is yeah. great. The, the, I guess the thing that I'm more worried about is to see games from the Zenobia Awards being picked up by publishers that are not traditionally doing historical games and that are really thinking about games as entertainment products first and, and foremost. And I guess yes. we'll see about that. There, there, there were no announcements yet, but if there are, I think I would definitely bring some people in and, and get their perspective on this. Maybe going sure, back yeah. to the to the Zenobia Award specifically, yeah. I wanted to talk yeah. about, about how was it for you? How was the whole process? What was your experience? What did you feel that you get uh, from, from, from the Zenobia? So just yeah. a, a, like, it's been a few months now, almost a year, yeah. maybe more. I don't remember. Time is <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, but now, that you, yeah, now that you have had some time, when you look back and reflect upon it, what, were you, or what are your thoughts about Zenobia and what, what did it bring you? I think it was really, really fantastic experience. And I feel I learned learn a lot and a lot is is an understatement I would say um, I always mentioned that in the beginning that I, I I don't ever think that I can design a board game because a board game is such a complicated thing to design there are so many things that needs to hang together that needs to work together there are balance um, there are many pathways to victories for example so many little things that I felt like my little brain won't be able to hold any of this 
But what Zenobia did really, really great is that first, so first and foremost, they would assign you a mentor so that you go through the process and the, the journey not alone. You have someone else that's from the outset is on your corner and would root for you for your success. Um, and in my case, that uh, Kevin Bertrand from the um, Fort Circle game. And he's been really fantastic. Like he's since the very beginning, he's he's always saying like how good the game was and how much he believes in me and 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 the game design. So that in itself is a significant boost, maybe for someone like me, like to have someone who really uh, believe in you. Um, so that's number one. But even the way that Zenobia Award is, um, I would say the process is being structured is really, really helpful because what happened is that you're not coming and you go, here's a ready-made design, but you actually started from the idea, right? It literally started with, give us a paragraph about what you think the game is going to be. And then from that paragraph, when you, you go towards the end of it, it becomes a complete game. So, but there's steps from that paragraph becoming a game, right? So that paragraph turned into uh, a one-page explanation of what you think the mechanism is going to be and so on and so forth. And then that turns into, um, okay, what is, you know, the first the first kind of like gameplay and then what would be the rule book and then so on and so on. So it becomes like um, a step-by-step -step way of how you develop a board game. And because it is broken down to this step-by-step -step way, I never felt too overwhelmed, even though it was quite intense. And, and I know that this is also the experience of my other um, fellow finalists, not to speak for them, but because we discussed about this as well, that it was such an intense time because you are given like um, maybe a month, for example, to submit a particular thing, you know, submit a prototype, submit a complete rule book or something along that line which me means that during that one month time, you really put in the defaulting time to make sure that your game is to that point. And to be fair, that really, really spurred all of us to, to really work on the game, you know, to find time to work on the game. Because I know after we completed Zenobia Awards, then um, there is a process of um, publishing. Right. And then during that time, of course, you still want to develop the game. And to be very honest, because we don't have the structure of Zenobia anymore, the development of the game is not as intense as it was before. And so the game is not as developed as quickly as it would have been compared to what, what, how it was when it was the Zenobia process. So yeah, so that in itself has is, is been really, really great. And then on top of that, not just your mentor, the entire community and the entire, like all the people, including you, Fred, as part of the Zenobia process as well, has been very, very, very supportive. And it's really amazing how open people are and how willing people are to support you. I uh, remember that I could just reach out to anyone in the Zenobia Award and ask for their opinion, ask for their inputs, for their help. And they are very willing and very present to support you, to, to get you over the next line that you need to cross, for example. So, yeah, it's been absolutely fantastic uh, to me. And I, I do hope that it can have you know, another edition of Zenobia Award. I would love to give back. You know, I would love to be part of the next process. Um, yeah, so hopefully there will be one. Yeah, let's hope for it. I think it's it was a great initiative, and I think it would be too bad if if it was something that only happened once. And I'm wondering, do you still have contact with the, this network that you built during the Zenobia? Is there still like a like formal or informal ways for participants to meet up? How is it going in that regard? Yeah, especially with the finalists, there are eight of us. I'm saying, yeah, eight of us, and we are very close. Uh, we have our own Discord server, and then we sometimes just like, hey, do you guys want to Zoom? So we just, um, or like chat in Discord. So we set up a time where we all like jump in and just update one another about what the situation is. Um, not just about the game, but our life in general. And we support one another when it comes to publishing. It was a bit weird. I don't know what the word for it is because obviously when we were finalists, we were supposed to be competing against one another to to win the, the entire award. But <laughs> no one is competitive. No one, everyone was just like, there for each other and really want each other to, to succeed. So it, it's a such such a great group to have. And everyone was just it was just really rooting for one another and really wanting everyone to uh, for their games to be published. Um, so yeah, we're still we're still very much uh, in touch right now and and, and still talk uh, once in a while. And I'm close to some of them a bit more than the others. So we also talk like one on one stuff like that. So yeah, definitely we're, we're 
I'm, I'm happy that we're still in contact even now. Going mm -hmm. back to your game, there is one question that I was wondering about, uh, about Cartini is, you said that the three foundations for your life were color stories and games. How did yes. you, and did you manage to implement that in your design? And if so, how? Yes, <laughs> thankfully, yes. So, um, I mean, games in itself is the gameplay. I always make sure that even when the during the development time with Iron Game Design, um, I understand that first and foremost, the mechanism of the games really need to be able to stand on its own. You need to make sure that there's a balance to the, to the mechanism and so on and so forth. Uh, but also at the same time, whenever we had kind of like a development chat or meeting, I always ask the developer, the IM game developers, uh, whether the, the game is still fun. You know, whenever they do play testing, do you ask people whether the game is fun? Because to me, first and foremost, that's the most important. I am designing a game. Um, it happens to be, um, it has a historical setting and then, you know, there's some historical learnings of it. But first and foremost, it's a game. So it needs to be fun. So for me, that's important. And I'm happy to say that at least so far, people has been enjoying themselves playing the game. So I'm, I'm quite happy about that. I hope uh, that is true. Uh, and so, yeah, that's the, the game part. I feel like tick that's, um, that's included. Um, the stories, obviously, because the entire game was inspired by the story of not just Kartini, but um, the kind of like women empowerment, women emancipation during that time in Indonesia. So stories is, is very much entrenched uh, um, in every aspect of, uh, of the game. And um, colors, uh, illustrations of the game to me is very, very, very important. I like beautiful games and, you know, I think all of us do, uh, even though I said like, you know, I, I actually, I don't mind Euro games are a little bit dry, but if it's a beautiful Euro games, it's definitely a lot more appealing than maybe just, you know, like a, a placeholder <laughs> illustration Euro games, for example. So to me, uh, what the illustration looks like, um, the color schemes and everything like that is very important. And I think Iron Game does a very, very good job um, Uh, with that, so far, I really like what I'm seeing. Um, and like I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also consulting in terms of what the, the characters look like, what are they wearing, um, even, for example, the player boards, um, each player has a school that they're managing, each of those player boards um, representing different types of houses in Indonesia, um, located in each of the islands that are in the game. So, you know, so yeah, so and colors also part of the game. So all three, uh, thankfully, are, are there in the game right now. Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> Uh, do you have any advice for aspiring designers who wish to make historical games uh, in the context of maybe there won't be a Zenobia Award, but if there is another one, I, I guess that your first advice would be please join and, and participate. I do. I, that you... would be my first advice. <laughs> yes. But, but beyond that. Yes. Uh, beyond that, um, what do I mean, I guess what I learned for myself during this entire process is that when you are, I, I guess when you are designing a game that is about historical context, Sometimes we forgot that, I guess sometimes we might choose one over the other, right? Like not choose, but maybe because of the way that the development process is going. That sometimes we think what's the most important is for the story to be out there, but then we might sacrifice gameplay because of it or vice versa. And I think if we can strive to make sure that both elements are always there, then that would be ideal. I would say ideal because of course, you know, you, you know, fine fall in the spectrum a little bit more towards one way or the other. But I would I would strive for that. And I would, in, in my case, like I said, I, um, as much as possible, try to stay true to the elements and the spirit of the games, including, for example, there was a discussion before between me and Iron Games about what needs to be included in a card. And I fully understand that a card cannot be too busy. A card cannot be like, for example, text in the cards cannot be too small because then it's hard for people to see and so on and so forth. Um, but I did insist to have the story to be represented, even if just a little bit on the game. So, for example, the heroes that are in the game, there's a little bit of their stories uh, in the card themselves. And the reason for that is because, well, for example, you can have a choice where you just have the picture of the heroes and then you know, look up the stories of the heroes in the rule book, for example. But I don't want that because that means that it takes another step for someone to then get to know the story of the heroes of, um, 
And I want it to be something that is there as part of the game. So when you are looking at the card, when someone else are taking their turns, you can look at the card and you can actually read a little bit about that part of history. And then that's how you then, you know, get to know a little bit more about that, uh, that setting. So to me, that's very important that it is part and parcel of the game, that you don't have to take another step in order for you to get to know more about that context of history. So by the end of the day, it's 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 a decision making, right? Like when it comes to the, to the game itself. And to me, that's an important decision making. And if there's if one more thing, because um, I'm also talking to like a like a a couple of a friend of a friend who's designing a board game that is informed by a cultural context. So what I also learned is that it's important for that cultural context to not be a copy paste, so to say. So it's not it's not like a sticker, right? Uh, to me, if the mechanism of the game can stand on its own and then you can just put another theme on top of it or another um, historical context on top of it, then it might not be strong enough as a historical games. I think if you can really make, make it integrated that if you take away the theme, the game would not stand, I think that would be the ideal. So if there is a way for you to kind of really make sure that the mechanism of the game is really informed by the historical context so that it becomes kind of like unique because of that combination between the two, I think that would be a stronger historical game rather than just, for example, um, you have a mechanism and then you put on top of it a certain historical setting. So yeah, I think those are some of the things that I, I, I myself is, is, is learning. Those are great advice. And now looking forward to the to the future, now that you've had this experience making this first game, usually it's like it lights up something in people and, and they tend to have a tendency to want to make more games. And is it the case for you? Yeah. Are you planning on making more designs? Are you working already on new things? And can you tell us a bit more about this journey? Yeah, no, ever since uh, I started with Zenobio, I mentioned that I, I never thought I would design a board game because it, to me, it's just one of the most complicated things. Um, I always equate it to like a Formula One car because there's just so many elements that needs to kind of like really work together. But I've, ever since the, the Zenobia Award uh, process, what has happened is that I would see things and it would inspire me to think about like, oh, that could have been a game you know, that could have been another board game. So I started to have that kind of way of thinking. And I would absolutely love to be able to design another board game. I just, I guess at the moment is I kind of have somewhat, somewhat a philosophy in terms of what kind of games that I want to make. And it's not necessarily always historical games, because I feel like sometimes people get boxed into, oh, you know, this person always make narrative base game. This person always makes RPG. This person always makes uh, party games, for example. And I think it'd be great for a designer to be able to be versatile, you know, that they can they can explore different things that they want to design and not being pegged onto a certain way of designing and being, you know, um, a Dutch Indonesian, uh, a, a Dutch Indonesian woman, I don't think that the only game that I can design are those that are has something to do with Indonesia, that has something to do with history. I feel like, you know, I, I do want to be able to explore other possibilities. But if there's any specific philosophy or kind of like direction that I would love to explore in the in, in the future, I mentioned this before, is that I would love to start, if board gaming starts to also embrace what I would consider um, like in, in, in console games or video games uh, world um, is right now called the wholesome games. So games that are usually a bit more appealing towards demographic uh, that tends to be at the moment, maybe kind of like younger women. Um, of course, there are other demographics as well, but I think this is like the, the biggest uh, demographic at the moment. Think about think games such as Animal Crossing, for example, or Stardew, Stardew Valley and so on. So those kind of games, I feel we don't necessarily have those comparable games in board gaming. And I feel like there are still quite sentiment in board gaming that board gaming can't be too kiddies, can't be too childish. There's a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction that um, if you have a game with an illustration that is a little bit too maybe children-like, then people would, you know, kind of like frown a little bit, like, oh, why, why is the theme, why is it the theme, or why is that the illustration? Or even consider them to be too saccharine, 
you know, too sweet. <laughs> and I wonder why that's the case, because I feel like we might be alienating um, a certain group of people or a certain kind of um, sensibilities that we are not exploring in board gaming. So I would love to also, if I can, explore that kind of like possibilities as well. I think that's a really interesting point, because in my... <laughs> So in my professional life, I also think a lot about uh, types of play, how people play and how people engage with games and everything. So that's always something that I'm interested in. And I really like this idea of wholesome games. And, the, and it's true that when you look at board games and I was looking at my collection, they are very conflict driven. It, it can be really cutthroat and everything. And even if they are a cooperative game, it always puts you under a huge amount of tension. You've got to do so many things in a very limited amount of time and yes. everything. And, and I feel like... It's not, we are only starting to see some of those games. Maybe there were some older ones that I'm not thinking of, but I'm thinking about Flamecraft that was released, I think, last yes. year. And I was like, yes. and, when I, and when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's refreshing. Like, it just looks like a nice game. Like, it's a with very Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yes, and, exactly. I'm ha and happy to say one of uh, the Zenobia Award finalists, Lauren, he's uh, right now with uh, Cardboard Alchemy, the one who made Flamecraft. So, yeah, yeah so we, we, we chat a lot about this as well. Okay, but that's yeah, but that's the the one that that, that came to mind, and of yeah, course, certainly, Wingspan. Certainly. Wingspan yeah, is a bit like this, yeah. also in in that regard, and I, I think it's uh, but I guess it's also making sure that we have uh, maybe more diverse designers because my I think, and that's the whole thing about about Zenobia is that if we want to see different games, we need to have different people making them also. So yeah, uh, absolutely. So that, it's, yeah, it's it's probably a chicken and egg problem as well, right? Like, because if you're making a game and then you are aiming for a particular audience, but that audience is not yet represented in the broader board gaming community, the question is, how are you going to reach out to them, right? Like, because they might not be playing board game at the moment. They might not even know that there's, that they can enjoy playing board games, probably because there are no board games that appeals to them. So the question is, do we need to make them first board gamers or do we make board games for them first so that be, they become board gamers? I think that's a, that's a chicken and egg kind of like uh, problem as well there. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought. We won't solve it now, but I think it's uh, there are some initiatives <laughs> yes. and, and, I, and I hope that to see more wholesome game in the future yes. for sure. But it was a yes. great conversation. Thanks again for taking the time. I would hope to have you back when the game is released because the thing that I like to do on my channel usually is do teach and plays with the designer. Uh, so you can come with uh, your developer, for example, or something like this. And we'll ask you while we play questions about the game and everything. And we learn uh, playing the game with you and with the, the developer during that, uh, during that time. But for now, it's the campaign time. I wish you a very successful campaign. Uh, and I hope to see you again soon. And thanks again for being with us. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you so much, Fred. Bye.